Welcome to another episode of Electable. I'm Deb Chubb, and I'm here today to talk about the Equal Rights Amendment. And we're very honored to be joined by Bettina Hager. She is the DC Director of Outreach and Advocacy for the ERA Coalition. Um, and she, she manages their programs and policy work. So um, welcome, Bettina. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited for this conversation. Good. Oh, me too. So um, there has been more activity recently, you know, surrounding the ERA. Um, and so this is very exciting. And uh, we don't, you know, I feel like, wait, what happened? I don't know, you know, where did this come from? What's happening now? How did we get here? Why aren't we done with this? So I'm hoping you can give us first, a, you know, kind of a, just a, a quick history of the ERA, just to get us sure. up to where we are now. Yeah, well, I mean, as as uh, my our former president CEO and my mentor Carol Jenkins likes to say, there's no real quick history, but I will do my best. Yeah. So, it, you know, the Equal Rights Movement has a 100 year history, having first been introduced in 1923 by, um, well, introduced to the world by Alice Paul, but then also introduced in Congress in 1923. And since then, it's had sort of ebbs and flows, and in, in the level of activity around it. Uh, at a national scale. So for quite a while, um, there was there was support, but it, it was growing to the point of actually being able to be passed in Congress. Um, and, and that took itself 50 years. So it was introduced in 1923, and it was actually passed through Congress in 1972. Uh, it was originally passed the first time through what's called a discharge petition, which will be important in terms of you know the procedures that we may have to use today uh, by Martha Griffiths in 1970 when she introduced the discharge petition, which requires getting 218 signatures um, to the House to bypass the committee to bring it to the floor for a vote. Um, at that time, there was a member of Congress, Emanuel Seller, who was not supportive of the ERA in the committee chair per personship seat and he wouldn't allow it to get to the floor. So she filed a discharge petition, it passed overwhelmingly, and then in the next session, it passed the House and the Senate and went to the states for ratification. So in order for a constitutional amendment to be considered fully ratified and added to the constitution, it has to be passed in the House and the Senate by a two thirds vote, which it well over exceeded that level of support in the 70s and then ratified by three quarters of the states. So when the ERA was sent to the states, at the very beginning, at right after 1972, there was a huge rush to ratify. In fact, you know, Hawaii was able to be the first because they have such a you know time difference. So their legislature <laughs> wow. was still open. So their legislature was still open that same day. And so they actually were the first to do it just because of the time difference, because there was wow. such a, a desire to be the first. Um, and then, unfortunately, as time went on, uh, opposition mounted, came with a lot of, you know, untruths and and fear tactics to scare people away. Um, and the momentum to ratify in the state slowed down. Interestingly enough, the last state to vote to ratify in the 70s was Indiana in 1977. Who'd have thought? So, well, apparently Alice Paul, <laughs> as, well, the yeah. story goes, as the story goes, uh, she she gave the hint or the tip to the advocates and said the next state will be Indiana. And, and it was. Oh, wow. Um, and Alice Paul, for anyone who doesn't remember, she was the one that worked so hard on suffrage, um, you know, back in, you know, before 1920, you know, was chaining herself to the fence outside of Woodrow Wilson's, you know, White House, ended up uh, going to jail, being, you know, force fed and, you know, kind of tortured, you know, and really mistreated. Um, and, um, you know, I luckily lived to see uh, women's suffrage um, enacted um, and then carried on to work for the ERA. So amazing. Because she saw the um she saw that she saw that her, you know, her goal and mission of sex equality in this country not being done simply by the ratification of the 19th Amendment, which was the amendment that said you can't discriminate um on voting on the basis of sex. 
So the Equal Rights Amendment, which I probably should have said this up front, is an amendment. It's very simple. It's only 24 words. Um, it it said it basically. It, I mean, it is just a prohibition against sex discrimination. Very simple. 24 words. Equality of rights under the law shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or any state on the basis of sex. That's it. Um, as a lot of people like to point, it is simple equality. So, well, what we've learned is that equality isn't simple, but yes. it but it should be. It should be much more than it is now. So, um, so the fear, I think, you know, what happened in the seventies was that there became sort of a fear of what society would look like with equality, and so that you know, all of these things like would destroy families as we know it and women would need to be in combat roles and you'd have unisex bathrooms all of which a i don't think it's been the dissolution of the the family <laughs> um oh. not the era um it also isn't here so if it was it's not the era's fault uh women are in combat uh roles and proud to be so um and if anyone has gone onto a plane we all know unisex bathrooms are everywhere so those were the arguments though mainly that kept the ERA from being ratified by what was originally a seven year deadline put into the preamble of the amendment. That seven year timeline would have expired in 1978, so the year after Indiana ratified. However, as I noted, Indiana was the last and 35th state in order to get enough states to ratify for to be added to the constitution, it needs three quarters, which is 38. So there was a bill passed to extend the deadline another three years that expired in 1982. And unfortunately during that time, no, no further states ratified. So um, I think for a lot of people, they felt like, okay, well, that's the end of the story back in the eighties. Um, but that was not the end of the story for, for, for many people who continue to work on the ERA, even after the expiration of the deadline or the time limit, um, continuing to push for ratifications and, um, just keeping the movement going because this is such an important thing to have in our constitution. 83, 82% of countries in the world have a sex equality provision in their constitution. You know, as I said, this should not be so complicated. It is right. equality. Right. So, um, you know, it it wasn't, I mean, there's a simplification of it, which you could say was the 2016 election. And we all know that that really woke up a lot of people in this country to the fact that we are not in what I used to hear all the time, like a post-feminist world, right? Or a post-sex equality world, if you if you put it in a more you know, current way of, of speaking, um, with the election of Donald Trump. And not just him, but the rhetoric that came out around him and was repeated by many people, you know? He was elected yeah, and president. And seemed to kind of um, ignite uh, a new level of misogyny or a hidden level of misogyny is what I, yeah, what yeah, I like. well, you yeah. know, it was, it Unless was you're hidden in it, then yes, hidden <laughs> yeah, a new level in the fact that people were no longer just saying it behind closed doors. He gave right. them the, to say it outside. And so I think that that is really kind of was the, was the impetus for this movement to heat up, but there have been women working in, all of the states that ratified recently, they were working in those states for decades. But the actual momentum to get it done came really after we saw Donald Trump's election, the Women's March, Me Too, and just a heightened focus because it became clear that it was still necessary. I mean, those of us who were working on it knew it was necessary. So it's not like people thought it, there were plenty of people who, who knew it was necessary. But it became much more abundantly clear when people came out from the hiding of their very overt misogyny to the to the greater public that it was still necessary. So, um, you know, and then actually part two to that was that in Nevada, 
they elected the most women in their state legislature that ever there were. Yeah, first ever uh, state uh, legislature with majority women. Yes, they are. Yeah. So and you um, should see what they're doing. I mean, and you should see what they're doing. Exactly. That's it's why amazing. it's so important to have women in state legislatures. Yeah. So one of those women, Pat Spearman, um, had taken on the mantle even you know before the t- the results of the 2016 election. But with that, they had everything really in place in Nevada. Um, they had the legislate the ability to move through the legislature. They had really the the public momentum and support, and they had the advocates who had been there for decades, um, really advocating for it. And and so everything kind of came to life, and Nevada became the 36th state to ratify 40 years after Indiana. Nice. So then Illinois became the 37th state to ratify the next year, and then Virginia became the last required and 38th state in 2020. So bringing that number up to like the golden 38 (laughs) that we all right. Um, So it should be done. You know, the year I satisfied everything that was laid out in the constitution under article five, which is kind of the part of the constitution that that explains how you amend it. Um, All requirements have been, uh, you know, fulfilled. So right now, the Equal Rights Amendment is the 28th Amendment. So, but, but now what about the time limit? Yeah, the like, time limit. Yeah, what's the deal? So that's kind of like, that's the hang up, right? So it's really hard. And as you're saying, if you don't know all the history of it, it makes no sense. You're like, so you're telling me it's the 28th Amendment. It's fulfilled everything. Okay, so why when I open the pocket constitution, is it not there? Right. Understand the confusion. Completely understandable. Um, so in order for an amendment to be added to your pocket constitution, it needs to be published by the archivist. And upon receipt of Virginia's ratification as the 38th state, the archivist did not publish. And that was a result of the archivist reaching out to the Department of Justice, which at that time was under the Trump administration mm-hmm. for advice. Um, and the Trump administration's Department of Justice said, don't publish because the timeline has ex- has expired, basically. Um, and there was probably also mentioned the fact that some of the states had, you know, purportedly rescinded, although there's nowhere in the Constitution that allows for that to happen. So he sent a letter, he got this feedback, and then never published it. So so it is it is a little bit confusing because it should be recognized and implemented as the 28th Amendment. Because, you know, there's nothing even in the Constitution that says it needs to be published by the archivist. But because it hasn't been published, um, it just, it, it hasn't been recognized as the 28th Amendment widely, and it's not being used in the courts as such. So it's, um, you know, the, the language we now use around the ERA, it's not past the ERA. The ERA was passed in 1972. It's not ratified the ERA. The ERA was had its final required ratification in 2020. We're saying recognize the ERA, you know, okay. recognize it as a 28th Amendment. That's what needs to be, you know, to happen. And if recognition of the ERA requires the archivist publishing, we want the archivist to publish, you know. So why um, why does the time limit that was initially set not matter now? So, I mean, there are lots of, there are lots of like legal arguments you go into all the the case, you know, the case law and the and the history and Dylan. And, but the truth of the matter is that this is completely a novel situation. That's the that's the word people love to use. There are similar situations that have have occurred, but nothing exactly like it, right? And that's kind of been seen throughout the history of amendments being added to our constitution. So um in the past in uh i think it was related to prohibition the first time an amendment had a time limit put in it was the prohibition amendment and the interesting thing is 
and this was said by completely nonpartisan people, uh, representatives of the, of the CRS, the Congressional Research Service, which is like the whole purpose of this group is like to have people who love to interpret the constitution and laws and, yeah. but they're nerdy. They're not politicians. They're not political. They're just, all they love to do is look at the history of, you know, nice. of the law and of what's happened. And so they came to um, one of the first briefings we had in the Senate on this bill that we've been working on to move the deadline in like nine, in like 2014. And they told this great story, which they found highly amusing, which is that the reason that time limits ever even kind of became a thing was because of prohibition. When the movement for an amendment to prohibit alcohol, which is what prohibition was, um, was part of like the public dialogue, it was so popular. Temperance movement was very popular. And so you had these members of Congress who were saying, you know, we have to act to please our constituents but we still want to drink our alcohol. So their idea was, hey, let's put a time limit on it. You know, that way we can vote, make everyone happy. There's no way it's going to happen in seven years. You know, have our cake and eat it too. Little did they know, okay, yeah, no, it actually was ratified. And it's the only amendment that has had to be like undone by ratifying yet another amendment. Right, right. But, um, and the Supreme Court said that basically, um, there's nothing that says you have to have a time limit, but Congress has, you know, very, um, you know, it, it has a lot of freedom to do whatever it wants to do. And if freedom, and if they said they want to, you know, establish a rule to how the amendment process should go, okay, they can, right? But they don't have to. And there's nothing in the Constitution that says that they should. So, um, the idea behind it was saying, oh, well, it's because we need to make sure that, um, you know, the, the state ratifications are sufficiently contemporaneous, which basically just means like, oh, you don't ratify an amendment. And then the states that ratify it are completely, you know, um, so far removed from the Congress that voted on it that it just doesn't make sense anymore. But that kind of thought process really became clear that it was, that this is not something that sh that should be looked at and upheld because of um, what became the 27th amendment, which was the Madison amendment. So as I said, nothing is quite the same, but um, the Madison amendment was, you know, initially proposed back when the bill of rights were passed and it wasn't included. So um, it's an amendment about congressional pay raises. And it was uh, finally ratified by the last required states 200 years after its introduction. So, I mean, it really kind of begs the question of like, why is that seen as okay and sufficiently contemporaneous 200 years and the ERA where, you know, we're nowhere near 200 years, we're being said, oh, it, it can't be, it can't be acknowledged because this time limit, which was meant to make it sufficiently contemporaneous. Anyway, the point being, it feels like yet again, we're held to a very different standard that is holding sex equality back from being added to the constitution. Um, additionally, it was in the preamble of the amendment, which means that it was not something that uh, was ever voted on by the states. So it's kind of more equivalent to the idea of like a piece of legislation because um, rather than, you know, the amendment, so no states voted to um, approve the time limit. And in other instances, time limits were included in the amendment. So, you know, it's not like, I mean, an accident, Congress knows that they can include the time limit in the amendment. They didn't, they put it in the preamble. So yes. again, as I'm saying, like everything is slightly different, like there's nothing that's exactly the same, which is what makes it probably a little bit more difficult, but also, um, but, but, you know, also there's nothing, there's, it, I think it kind of proves the point that every single case is different and there's no reason that this, the Equal Rights Amendment should be held back because of 
you know, arbitrary time limits that, you know, adding a time limit, the initial reasoning for it was actually to hope that you don't see the initial reasoning for time limits was to hope that amendment doesn't get added to the constitution. If you look back on the history of it. So it's a long, varied history, but it is, yeah. yes, but we have seen a, it was in the preamble, not voted on by the states. Congress has in the past put it in the amendment. So they must know that there's a difference between the two. Otherwise, why just have things done differently? Two, if you're saying that the uh, time limit is because it needs to be sufficiently contemporaneous, why does that apply to this and not to the 27th Amendment, which took 200 years? Just none of it makes sense. And, um, and you know, no, none of it also is explained in the Constitution. So it's our argument that it's all arbitrary and it, the, yeah, it, it is the 20th Amendment, but it's, right. it is complicated. Right. Um, yeah. I mean, it sounds like, you know, just a bunch of excuses. Um, yeah, basically. Yeah. yeah. So, okay. So now um, you're working on, you know, another project concerning ERA. And then also there is work going on at the state level in many states. Um, so, so tell us what you're doing at the federal level now. Um, I know you've, you know, you've entered, you know, you've gotten some Congress people to introduce resolutions to, you know, ignore the time limit to move forward. So tell us about that and tell us how that's going. Sure. So going back to the time limit, as we spend a lot of time talking about, um, the idea with the resolutions that have been introduced in the House and the Senate is that if Congress can vote to put a time limit on, because they have a lot of, um, of just they can they can decide to do things they can decide to take it off so this bill has congress clarifying that actually it's not standing in the way of the 28th amendment being recognized and published in the constitution the bill additionally has been updated so it was first introduced in 2012 before virginia became the 38th state so this session the bill goes even further in affirming that Congress is stating that this is the 28th Amendment having been ratified by three quarters of the state. So the bill is aimed at taking away the time limit argument. In a way, it's just Congress simply saying, we're not standing in the way, you know? No time limit should stand in the way. If there are other concerns after that, they can be figured out. Right but Congress is not the one standing in the way. The 28th Amendment being recognized as the as the ERA being recognized as the 20th Amendment. And additionally, we're going to make sure that you know that we think it's valid, that it has sufficiently um, fulfilled all of the requirements. So that is something that um, we would like to see because of what's happening in the courts and the fact that the archivist hasn't published. But again, as you're saying, we don't feel like it should be necessary but it's one of those things where if you're putting an excuse in front of us, we will rise to the occasion to show you that that excuse shouldn't be used to keep us from having sex equality in the constitution. So um, that's been introduced in the House and the Senate. In the Senate, there was a vote uh, just, I think just last month in February. Oh wait, no, that's not true. <laughs> it's not February. Yeah. I always get my March and May confused. Yeah, but okay. anyway, April. Um, and uh, sorry, the hearing was in February. And and although we did receive a bipartisan majority of support in the Senate because of the filibuster, uh, we weren't able to get it to go to the floor. We received the number of votes that it needs to pass, but because of yet again another procedural excuse. Right. Um, we weren't able to get it to the floor for a full vote. Leader Schumer did enter a motion to reconsider. So the bill is still alive um, and we can bring it up again later in the session. So so, we, uh, so the vote got it got 53 votes, right? Well, so so it got um, so it originally had 52 votes in favor. Diane Feinstein would have been the 53rd, but she was not in attendance that day. 
the number, if you go online, says 51 because Leader Schumer had to change his vote from a yes to a no in order to enter the motion to reconsider. So that was actually a really big deal and a huge sign of support from the leader that he was willing to do that. So um, so you think you have 53 votes, um, but we need um, 60 um, to overcome the filibuster rule. Is that right? Yes. So good. I mean, I cannot believe that there are not seven Republicans out there who, you know, so, you know, believe in um, women's equality enough to get this passed. Um, I mean, well, that's our hope is that, you know, now that we've had that vote, um, A, we have constituents, you know, we have people like you and your listeners who live in Indiana. Both of your senators voted against the legislation. Right. You should be hearing from their constituents that that's not right, yes. you know? that they want someone in office who represents them and their values and represents, you know, the fact that equality is a, should be. And I think most people everywhere in this country feel that equality is, is a bedrock of our country. Um, so there's no reason to be afraid of it. Um, and basically all your, that senators are being asked to do, as I said before, is clarify that they're not standing in its way. It's yeah, already I mean, been by Congress. Okay, when Congress I say there are seven Republicans, I guess I don't mean any from Indiana. <laughs> so there's 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 got to be seven somewhere else, <laughs> just not in Indiana. I mean, and I, you know, of course, I did um, reach out to my senators and got you know the insulting um, you know pat on the head. And, you know, pushed aside kind of a uh, gesture that um, we're, you know, we're familiar with here in Indiana as women. Um, and so, um, I mean, it is insulting and outrageous, you know, I mean, yeah, I mean, I feel like, how dare you, you know, <laughs> tell me that everything's fine and we don't need it. Like, and because you're a woman and you know this, I mean, how do you know? Anyway, so, um, so we had to find uh, seven senators somewhere else. So seven Republican senators um, somewhere else, apparently, um, you know, Todd Young is once in a while reasonable. Um, but, um, you know, apparently not on this issue. So, um, I mean, I certainly, I will do my darndest, but, um, uh, but, um, but Indiana's, yeah. You know. So Alice Paul, um, you know, it was a different time <laughs> when Alice Paul had all that confidence in Indiana. Uh, Indiana's just not the state it used to be. So, all right. So now speaking of states, tell us what's happening at the state level. I know like some states are passing their own ERA legislation, right? They are. Uh, there's a lot of activity at the state level. Um, the coalition has its uh, state law audit project, which is led by A.J. Conroy. Mm -hmm. um, and we're working with state legislatures, asking them to go ahead and implement the 28th Amendment and review their you know, laws and, and state statutes to make sure that they're complying with the requirement that their sex discrimination is prohibited. Um, in addition to that, so that's kind of one of the things that um, we've been working with, which is actually working with um, advocates and constituents to request that their state legislatures do their own internal review and audit of their um, their laws. In addition to that, um, I think we've had about a dozen states this year introduce legislation to affirm the ERA as the 28th Amendment. So kind of similarly doing what we're asking the federal government to do, which is to just you know, put their stamp on it and say our state says that we are affirming you know, no action needed. This is the 28th Amendment. It should be recognized, it should be published. Indiana actually had a bipartisan pair of state senators introduce that resolution. Um, I think it, Resolution 39, uh, the sponsors were Senator Jean Bro and, and Senator Susan Glick. So that's good news. It's it optimistic. is. I was um, a little surprised, I will yeah. say, because Susan Glick was the uh, senator who carried the abortion ban um, last year. So I was really surprised to hear this. So, well, you know, um, I think that. Um, Oh, you know, I mean, she's a Republican and Jean Burrow, of course, is a delightful Democrat. She's awesome. But um, 
but yeah, I mean, uh, it was, and so good because I mean, she has done some other decent things over the years um, on the environment. She has been okay. Um, but, um, but anyway, surprising and, you know, um, but I don't know. So, so I didn't even hear about it until um, AJ emailed me and I was like, what we did where? So I don't know what happened. And I assume it, you know, I assume it died. Um, um, so uh, it did pass in four states. I'm sorry. It did pass in some states. So it passed in Colorado. It's previously passed in California, passed in Hawaii, um, passed in Illinois. So, you know, your neighbor. Um, so, yeah, so there, there are states around the country who are, you know, not even just introducing these resolutions, but they're passing them. Um, there are states that are introducing state ERAs for their own constitutions. Uh, Minnesota, Minnesota at the very end, I of their um, session this year. I guess they have another one next year. Um, the House voted to to uh, pass, and which I guess is the first process of amending their own state constitution. And they've apparently had, uh, or the Senate voted to pass either way. And they apparently just had confirm, or they had a, a promise that at the beginning of next year, the House would vote to. So uh, Maine has introduced legislation. A state URA will be on the New York ballot. Um, it already passed through its legislatures in two consecutive sessions. Um, it's most, as a lot of people know, Nevada just recently ratified a state URA. Oh, wow. So there's activity all across the country. Mm -hmm. uh, people understand the need for this type of protection. And, and I think that they're really getting excited for it. Well, that's awesome. So, and I, you know, I, sh I left um, our discussion uh, on the federal level um, before I should have, because I wanted to mention the um, ERA caucus, um, um, you know, started by um, the great um, Congresswoman Cori Bush out of St. Uh, St. Louis. Um, she is just delightful. And she was on, um, you know, I was able to join your last call and she was on there, you know, chatting and was uh, so terrific um, on that Zoom call, uh, talking about her work and, you know, uh, she's doing great work. And I know that, do you know how many Congress uh, members have joined that caucus, the ERA caucus? So as of last Thursday, I'm pretty sure it was about 70, so 69 or 70 members have joined that caucus, which is really exciting. That's actually quite yes. a large caucus. Um, and uh, it is co-chaired by Representative Presley, Ayanna Presley from Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. And she is the lead sponsor of the House Companion of the Senate bill that I was speaking of earlier, <laughs> which, and, that, and that bill currently has 202 co-sponsors. Wow. Um, but, yeah. That's great. Yeah, so, um, yeah. Wow. I mean, she only needs like, I don't know, another 20 and that's it, right? I mean, wow. Less, less than that, actually. Yeah, uh, six, yeah. So. yeah. She needs what, two, uh, 218 or 219? 218. Wow, that's great. That's amazing. Yeah. Yes, and I know that um, Indiana's Congressman, uh, Andre Carson is a member of the ERA caucus, um, but as of yet, um, Frank Mervan, our other Democratic congressman in Indiana, has not joined. Um, and I have inquired and have not really heard back. So um, I will continue to inquire about that because that um, that is kind of surprising to me. Um, you know, he's a good Democrat, well, and he believes in women's We're all, equality. also hoping to see him. He's one of the, as I said, six, we need um, 16 to get the majority. Um, he could be one of those 16 because he has yet to co-sponsor the legislation as well. Although we, I did look up, he did vote for it in the last session. So we know he's an ERA supporter. It's just about getting him to, to get on the record again. Excellent. Oh, excellent. Well, so there you go. So now we're what, 203. I mean, basically, <laughs> I would think yeah. so. Great. Okay. So, um, so I did love that uh, idea. I talked to um, AJ about the legislative review uh, of laws in Indiana. And I thought, wow, what a terrific idea. That'd be great. Um, but I, I, I'm not sure if anyone has an appetite for that right now. Um, and, and I, and as you said, there was the um, resolution introduced, but it was, um, it didn't go anywhere in Indiana. And, uh, and I'm certainly we can try that again. Um, so 
I guess my my question is, you know, what can we be doing? What can we do here at the state level in Indiana, as it is? Um, what can we do to help move this issue along? Well, I mean, I think that, well, first of all, we can get Frank Mervin on the, on the bill. <laughs> yes. yes. Yeah. Um, but, and I know that it seems like um, probably not, likely to succeed but i think that having the rest of your members here from indiana so this is something that they care about is important so contacting young contacting ron and saying you know even if you say i don't think you're going to change but i think you need to let them know that what they did wasn't okay right and and once you do it and you tell your friends and then your friends tell more friends then they will hear from more Indianans. I do believe, as I said, you know, this is an issue that people care about. Um, it's always pulling between 80 and 90% uh, support throughout the country. So, I, I mean, I assume there are a lot of Indianans who support this as well and, and who know yes. that this is right. Yes, so and, yeah. they are That's literally true. voting against what the people who they represent care about. And they need to hear that. Um, and they also need to hear that if they don't change and start representing you, that they won't have another job. I mean, they'll have another job. They'll actually need a different job. That's right. But they they'll be looking, looking for a job. <laughs> they will be looking for a job. Because right. Right. I think someone said to me that when I said, um, you know, their senator... You know, it was helpful to have this Senate vote, right? Because we would never get anyone on the record to say, I don't support the ERA because they know that's not popular. They know it's not good to not support equality. And they know that this is equality. And so they never wanted to be on the record. So we have had advocates who've been lobbying their senators for like a decade on this bill, truly optimistic that when the day came, they would see them not give the terrible thumbs down, give the thumbs up. And, um, you know, after the vote, we were all talking as activists and someone said to me, oh, well, you can't win in insert state um, if you vote for the ERA or that's where that person's calculation came in. I was like, let's change that dialogue and say, you cannot win if you vote against the ERA. And okay. so that's what we need to be saying. And I'm not getting too, I hope I'm not getting too political, you know, here, but I do think that um, part of the work that we do with the coalition is also electoral. We have a campaign called Elect Equality, which we've done in the past two election cycles. And we're, um, it's been at the federal level mostly. We want to bring it to the state level this year as well, because we know that that's where a lot of, that's where the, you know, it's a hotbed of um, anti-progressive policies are yes, starting. Yes, yes. Um, and anti-equality progressive policies are being implemented. Um, but it is really important for voters to know, because I don't know that most Indianans know that their senators voted against saying that they're not standing in the way from our constitution prohibiting sex discrimination, because that's what your voter, your, your senators literally just voted to say they're okay with standing in the way of our constitution prohibiting sex discrimination. And I think most Indianans would not be okay with that if they knew, but most of them don't know. And so that's a lot of what we're working to do. We're working to do it with our, you know, public education campaigns. We're going to be working to do it in a more like focused way with our elected quality campaign um, because people deserve to know, you know, know who and what they're elected. Right. So. Well, yeah. And here in Indiana, it is difficult. But but, you know, thanks to you, um, we all know more now in Indiana, hopefully. And um, and we'll be pursuing this, um, you know, very heavily. Um, you know, Todd Young just got uh, reelected last year. So he's got, you know, six years. Uh, and so we really do need to work on him. He's you know, he's not going anywhere for a while. So you just really need to keep, you know, going after him. Um, and that's uh, the only way that um, hopefully he will change. Um, Braun is uh, up in 24, um, but is running for governor in Indiana. Mm. 
and um and so uh so he may be out of the mix soon so we'll have to make sure that this is a campaign issue in the 2024 um US Senate uh election cycle next next year um because this is a big deal um i mean i'm you know i'm completely offended that he wrote me back and said oh no it's no big deal um you know there's other legislation there's title 7 you know and there's you know title 9 um so if you're discriminated against in employment and uh, or in you know in education um um you know you've got this um you've got this to 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 look to um, but, you know, really, that's just insulting. I mean, to not realize what it means to not have equality in your country is. Well, it's is, especially is insulting post the Dobbs decision, which, you know, yeah, which we all know overturned Roe. But it additionally, you saw many of the Supreme Court justices go further and saying, well, let's question whether sex equality is covered at all in our Constitution. So what's right. Title IX and 20, Title Seven? What are they founded? What are they based on? The fact that we have sex, um, a, a prohibition, at least at the intermediate level, through the 14th Amendment. There are sex-based um, protections. So if the Supreme Court is already pondering whether or not they're going to recognize sex equality in the constitution that is a very very weak argument he's sending back to you right I mean, yeah that's pathetic i mean I, I suppose that you know it kind of um tempts you to see if you can find someone to sue um using um what we believe is the ratified um 28th amendment um uh for a violation of that um but of course now we have this um supreme court that is I mean, it's, you know, they, they just, they just hate women. I just, they just hate women. Uh, so, um, you know, so this is, of course, I guess not the best uh, strategy, huh? I mean, we will try every strategy in, that we can to see this in, in the constitution. And, you know, I think that the Dobbs decision makes it so clear that, um, that the, the, there's just no question of whether it's needed. You can't, you should, the fact that we have Supreme Court justices questioning whether or not the constitution should be interpreted as it was, you know, created and the 14th amendment, you know, we all know was not ratified with the intention that it would protect sex discrimination. Right. So, I mean, I don't know and that is, I mean, that will, those were Alito's words. I mean, like, if that, I, I can't imagine, yeah, if, like, how... that, you know, women were not included. They were not protected. Um, you know, they, Never, and so, so why should we protect them now? Yeah. And, you know, so I, I just, I, I can't even imagine, like you must, they must be so far removed from real life to not think of how devastating that is as a person who you know, their sex has been historically discriminated against to read that, you right. know. Right. Uh, yeah. That, that, that wouldn't be completely offensive and <laughs> kind of mind blowing. I mean, yeah. I mean, it, I mean, it's, it's mind blowing to think that someone could write that and, you know, so yeah, it's okay. So, yeah. So I would say to your Senator, you know, can you, sh would you like to read what a leader wrote? Um, and then tell me how safe I should feel under Title IX, Title VII, and every other title where my rights are protected under sex discrimination. That is a very so. good point. Very good. Very good. Thank you. I will do that. Exactly that. That is great. <laughs> okay. And so now tell us, um, you know, before we wrap up, tell us, tell us what else you're doing. Tell us, you know, how we can get involved and how we can be a part of this movement. Yeah. I mean, well, um, the easiest way to get involved is to go to our website, www.eracoalition.org. We have a take action page uh, where you can send messages to your members of Congress directly. You can send a message to the president telling him that you would like um, the person that he has oversight of, the archivist, to go ahead and publish the ERA's 28th Amendment. Um, we have... Um, just lots of ideas on how to get um, to get actively involved. We have blogs where people are, t are reading and, and making sure that you can have the most up-to-date information, um, both by reading our blogs and signing up for, for our newsletter. Uh, right now, as I said, we are really focusing on 
lots of different areas of programs, mostly around kind of federal policy, state policy, our electoral work and our public education work. So there are so many ways to get involved. Um, you know, everyone has a, well, it's funny because I'm in DC, so not everyone has a senator. <laughs> I don't have a senator, but most oh, yeah. people have members of Congress they can reach out to who are voting members of the yeah. of, of Congress to make sure that they know that it matters. Um, and then additionally, just becoming, just spreading the word yourself, you know, by doing a podcast yeah. that hopefully will will help to spread the message to more Indianans who may not know that we still need to be working for an equal rights amendment. And then on top of that, that neither of their senators are willing to not stand in the way of it being recognized as 28th amendment. So I think it's really important that we educate the public um, and, and just kind of become our own, you know, activation sites. That's right. So, well, we can do this. You know, women have done this uh, over the centuries. And, you know, yeah. and I don't think um, uh, this would be alarming to you to know that I think, uh, you know, women are really going to save the world um, because so far they, they pretty much always have. So yeah. um, so women are capable of doing this work and really need to, you know, just kind of get on board. And I think I think most women are ready at this point. So. All right. So that's great. So um, it's www eracoalition.org and I have been there. It's a good website, got lots of work. And um and I have been able to join on some of your Zoom calls, um, you know, kind of strategy meetings, and it's really great. I mean, there's Ellie Smeal from the 70s on there. I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> and you know, Corey Bush was on. And um, and then there are other women who are just, you know, really heavy hitters who have been working very hard and who are very aggressive uh, and really determined to really, you know, enshrine, you know, women's equality into the U.S. Constitution, as it should be. Um, that just doesn't make sense um, that it isn't there. Um, I, you know, I feel like the, you know, with the last, you know, the last um, constituency group who, you know, is still allowed to just be kicked around um, openly and publicly. And it's just, you know, pissing me off. So, um, so anyway, but anyway, well, thank you so much, Bettina, for coming on and, you know, talking about this. It, you know, it is a bit of a complicated issue and I appreciate you really kind of, you know, clearing all that up. Um, so, so we know where to go from here because, you know, someone, you have to, you have to understand it before you can really advocate for it. So, yes. So Thank I appreciate so that. It's yeah. been an absolute pleasure to talk, to speak with you. And, you know, I, I, I mean, I think that, um, you, what's you know, the funny thing to me that you mentioned is, is about the, the, um, the, the women that you've seen who you said are, are so aggressive and passionate about it. I think that that's hopefully one thing that people, I think sometimes people think like, oh, if I'll just, you know, move on, and I'll, I'll, you know, ignore it, it'll go away. Like we've been at this for a hundred years. We're not going away. <laughs> just get it done, you know, and it will help women. It will help the LGBTQIA plus population. It'll help men if they're just, it, it, it is, something that uplifts everyone it is you know incredibly important to um to you know seeing our society fulfill you know the promise of the american dream and democracy yeah, um, and the constitution and the constitution yeah i mean there were promises made so there were yeah yes all right well thank, thank you again and uh, it was just a, just a joy chatting with you thank you Bye.